Good morning, everybody. All over the world, people are on the move. Economic migrants, refugees from wars and civil wars, and often their journeys are dangerous and their futures are uncertain. What does it feel like to be on a journey like that? Maybe weeping for the home you have lost. Maybe wondering if you'll ever find a welcome, a place you can one day feel you can call home. Maybe just feeling so unsafe where you are and wondering if there's any protection for you at all. Well, we're picking up on a story this morning, running through the first book of the Bible, running through the book of Genesis, about a family, a family God has chosen and through whom a great nation will come about and through whom God has promised that all the nations on the earth will be blessed. And at this point, we're still focusing on one part of that family, the parents, Isaac and Rebecca, and the twin sons, Esau, and particularly the focus today on Jacob, the second born. Last week, if you were with us, there was a complex family scene where the younger brother, Jacob, got the blessing and birthright, which was due to his older brother, to Esau. His mother, Rebecca, set it up, and he followed through her cunning plan. And now today, we're working through the consequences. Older brother Esau has vowed to kill younger brother Jacob as soon as his father dies. Mother Rebecca has set it up for him to leave home with, father, uh, uh, um, with the father's help. And essentially, he is now on the run. And so he's a refugee. He can't stay at home. His brother will kill him. His mother can't protect him. His father's too old to protect him. And so he's going off to his mother's brother in hopes that he'll find a welcome and that things will cool off and he will ultimately be able to go home. Now this journey and this morning's story is kind of based in family strife. But it's also based in the fulfilment of the promise of God. And if you're like me, you might find those two things quite hard to reconcile. Wouldn't it be wonderful if when God fulfills his promises, everything is smooth and straightforward and there's no problems whatsoever and life was really easy? But I think we can experience, we can understand that it isn't like that. Rebecca, the mother has actually received a promise from God before the babies were born that the younger of her twins would rule over the older. You can find that in Genesis 25. Esau had already, before last week's story, sold his birthright for a meal when he was really hungry and his brother had cooked some food. And so he, New Testament says, had already despised his birthright. And the birthright is more than animals and maybe some tents and other wealth. No, the birthright also is the promise that has come to this family. His father Isaac is heir to a promise, promise given to his father Abraham, that his descendants would be a great nation and through them all the nations on the earth would be blessed. So Esau here has thrown away more than... Um, pots and pans and tents and camels and sheep or whatever, but he's also thrown away that great birthright. And now it's all a mess. Rebecca's taken things into her own hands. She hasn't waited to see what God would do. She's taken it into her own hands and set up Jacob to clinch these things. And Jacob, being at this point the not very strong character that he was maybe, has gone with it and has lied stolen the blessing of the, his father with lies and deceit, fallen in with everything she said. And in a sense, the family bit's kind of all squared off now. They've set up for where he's going. Father, I, uh, father Isaac has given him a, uh, his blessing again. But now we find him on this journey, terrified of what Esau's going to do. After all, Esau's the great hunter. I dare say Esau's arrow would be absolutely spot on for Jacob if he fired it from the right location. And 
Also, we can ask the question, what's God going to think of a man who has joined in this cheating, this lying, he's even taken God's name in vain. If we go back to last week's story in Genesis 27, he said to his father, when his dad asked him, well, okay, how did you get this food together so quickly? He said, God gave me success. He didn't say, mum told me to find a goat and she cooked it up quick for me. He said, God gave me success. And so he's in the middle of not quite nowhere, in the middle of Canaanite country, all alone, fearful, and wondering what's going to happen next. He's choosing to sleep under the stars, on a hard stone, a refugee. And he has a dream. And in that dream, he finds out what God thinks of him. And this is absolutely crucial to today. In the dream, he sees a stairway or a ladder linking heaven with earth, with angels ascending and descending on it. And then God speaks to him. And what's God going to say to a man who has participated in so much wrong? Well, we can read that. Genesis 28 and verse 13 says, there above it, above the ladder, stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God repeats his promise. In our terms, this may be a stolen birthright, but God is not condemning Jacob for his failings. Instead, he is to be blessed. And that's a theme for this morning. God is willing not just to accept sinful people, but to bless them and to use them. God's promise comes in three parts. The first part is the land. Jacob has been directed to the land God has promised to his father's people. He's taken a long time of nomadic existence, but now he's headed to his mother's relatives and he's so doing, he's here asleep in the land God has promised. The promise isn't yet fulfilled, but he's in the promised land. The nomad refugee will have a land, will have a home to call their own. Secondly, a people. Jacob is unmarried, but he has the promise of not just a child, but of a great family, a great nation that will come from him. And this nation will not just impact its own people, not just impact its neighbours, through Jacob's family, all nations on earth will be blessed. But there's something else here, something that in a way adds to those previous promises, and that is a very personal promise. God says, I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. I just want to pause for a moment at that. I want to look in a minute at how that is true for us as Christians too. I want to look at how that promise continues through all the ages. It'll mean different things in slightly different ways, but it is God's promise to us too. But that personal promise to Jacob must have been quite remarkable for him. Quite remarkable. Here he is, out in the open, wondering if his brother is behind any bush, as it were. Wondering what's going to happen next, what his destiny will be, knowing that he has fallen short. And God promises him, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll see it through with you. That's incredible. So how does it relate to us today? Let's bring it forwards. And I think 
one lesson when you read the Old Testament, when you're reading through stories like this, is always look, see if there's something in the New Testament that will link with it. There's been a broad promise all the way through that's pointing forward to Jesus. The way that all the nations will be blessed is going to be through Jesus, through this family. Ultimately, Jesus will be born of this family. But here, there's another link. In John's Gospel, in chapter 1, Jesus is talking to a new disciple, Nathaniel. Nathaniel has just declared to Jesus, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. How does Jesus respond? Jesus says, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I'm the bridge, says Jesus. I am that pathway that Jacob saw between heaven and earth. I am that bridge that links God and man. So the God Jacob is dealing with, in many ways, is no different from the God we worship today. His promises still hold good for you. And put it simply, are you anxious? Are you anxious about what's coming? I've got a big conference coming up at the end in early July. I'm going to be giving a talk there. It's the first talk I've given in a number of years. If I think about it too much, I get anxious about it. But God will be with me. I know that. But maybe it's bigger than that for you. Maybe you have an Esau. Maybe you feel there's something stalking you, something around the corner that's going to cause you harm. Maybe, like Jacob, you feel rejected. What did it feel like to be pushed out by your family like that, regardless of the commitments and promises that are being made? God is speaking as he spoke to Jacob. God is, through Jesus, that ladder between heaven and earth that connects the two. But if any of these things are true for you, then Jesus through the cross, as we saw in communion just now, Jesus will accept you. His character hasn't changed. He won't blot you out because you're not perfect. In fact, if we look into the book of Romans, it says to us, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God doesn't blot out the trickster God doesn't blot out the person who's taken things into their own hands. God doesn't blot out the person who's messed up. Through Jesus, God will accept us as we are. As we are. I want to give you another promise this morning. Another promise of Jesus. It's in John's Gospel again, chapter 10. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Can you see the parallel? Jacob brought safely to the land of promise. Through Jesus, we are brought safely to God's ultimate promised land to heaven. Now, The response is important. We can know these things, but God calls us to respond to him when we hear him speak. Jacob, first of all, was in awe. He was frightened. He was terrified. And as we read the Bible, it's not an uncommon reaction that where people meet first with God, then that reaction is to be overwhelmed by it. Could Jacob, sinful Jacob, be, have been expecting anything but anger? But then Jacob turns to worship. Jacob takes his stone pillow, he puts oil on it to anoint it, he sets it up. Ultimately, it'll be built up as an altar to God, as we'll see in a moment. But then he makes a commitment, he makes a vow. And I want to look at that commitment. At first sight, I think it's a bit confusing. It reads as if Jacob is being a bit tricky with God, negotiating with God. Let me read it to you. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me 
and will watch over me on the journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Kind of put it, if God does this and that for me, then I'll do this and that for him. If he gives me food and land and other things, then ultimately I'll give him a 10% cut. I don't really think that that properly holds water. I don't think that's a good reading of it. I think it relates to Jacob's culture and background. I think it relates to the experience he's just been in. I want to give you a slightly different reading, a slightly different interpretation. If you wanted to, you could go back to what I've just read and put the word wow in a few times and say, wow, if God's doing this for me, then. If God's doing that for me, then. But let me, let me just paraphrase. It's my own paraphrase. It's not a very good one. I was going on this journey on my own, in my own strength. I was terrified of my brother. I wasn't sure about God. Not sure whether he's my God. Not sure he wants to know me. But now he's made me a promise. And if he's willing to keep this promise to me, if he's willing to overlook all my failings, if he's willing to care for me and about me, then this is my response. He will be my God. This will be a place of worship. This will be God's house. And I'll commit to honour him with what he gives to me. And that's how the promise develops later on. If we go forward to Genesis 35... Jacob writes his own report about this time, and he says something like, well, I'll read, it, read a little bit more, Job 35, verse 1, if you want to turn to it. God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel, this is where the, the, the dream has taken place, go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and all to, who were with him, get rid of your foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. And here's the crucial bit. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So it looks as if Jacob's own report is that he trusted God from that moment. And of course, God did fulfill his promise to Jacob. God had said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob's testimony was, God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. God fulfilled his promise to me. God's promise to you today is no different to be with you to watch over you wherever you go, to bring you through all of life and death to the promised land, to heaven, to not leave us until he's done all he's promised. And like Jacob, this surely deserves our response. So briefly, let's look at the elements of his response. First of all, he said, the Lord will be my God. Perhaps you're not yet a Christian this morning. How do you respond to a God who loves you so much that he will accept you as he accepted Jacob? Needy, tricky, sinful Jacob. Loved you so much that he came in Jesus to die for you. Is willing to do what he offered Jacob to answer you in the day of your distress and be with you wherever you go. Maybe it's not a day of distress. Maybe it's a good day. Maybe all feels perfect for you. He'll still answer you if you call to him. His promise still holds true. For those of us who've trusted Jesus, have declared that the Lord is our God. Well, Jacob's next thing was to set up this pillar, this pillow rather, as an altar, a place to be called God's house. Essentially, he placed a marker for Bethel as a place where God would be worshipped. We see Jacob worshipping in different ways. He worshipped through his obedience. He went on with the journey. He came back to his father's house. He responded at different times to what God was doing. And and we've seen that in that Genesis 35 passage as well. That's all our worship. 
But maybe today we don't need to plant stone pillars or to build altars, but we do need reminders. And that pillar was a reminder that this was the place he met with God. The Bible is full of reminders. When Makita was talking on the video earlier on, she was talking about the way that the Bible was reminding her that God was with her as she dealt with her family issues and her school issues and other things. The Bible can be a pillar for us. Communion is a reminder. We've just taken communion together and Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And it's the most amazing physical, visual reminder of Jesus' death for us. Comes to all our senses as we share communion together. Meeting together regularly on a Sunday is a reminder. This is a reminder to us today to worship. We're helping one another to remember as we worship God. For some people, it's a special place in their home where they can go and have that quiet time with God. For others, it's a special time which they set aside as a reminder. The next thing we see is that Jacob worshipped God, the one true God, exclusively. There was a bit of trouble with his wives about foreign gods. We'll see that later on, but it wasn't so major. And as we've just read, he did tell them to get rid of them all before they went back to Bethel. But Jacob himself recognised that you can't add on extra bits. Maybe from your past spiritual experiences, bits of other religions that seem quite good. Maybe it's material gods with a small g. Maybe it's work gods or people gods or sporting gods. But Jesus, God, asks that we worship him exclusively. You shall have no other gods before me, says the Ten Commandments. And Jacob responded to that. Then finally, what about the tenth? What about this funny thing that he says, that he will give God 10% of what he has? We don't know whether it was one-off or regular. We don't know any further detail about it. It's not the first time a tenth is mentioned. Earlier on, Abraham has met this guy, Melchizedek, from Jerusalem and priest of Salem, and he gave 10%. So it's that 10% comes up through the Old Testament. Varying views of what it means. Is it money? Is it more than money? What do we do to represent this kind of return to God? I was struck by Irene Tongi on that video where she said, I realised I have been blessed to be a blessing to the nations. And then she went on and did that by giving her time and her energies and her efforts and everything else in the support of that school. It speaks of don't keep what God has given just to yourself. It speaks of returning to God from the, the good things and sometimes they're not so much that God has given to you. Corinthians 9, there's a, a verse, two verses that say, remember this, whoever spo sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So that was the third part of what... Um, of what Jacob was committing to commit to return to God something out of all that God was going to give him as he fulfilled his promise to him in the time coming ahead. And that obviously is developed later on and in other ways. But it speaks to us. What's our 10%? Maybe it's more than that. God's blessing you with bounty. What can it be used for? Building the church here building the church overseas, committing to a school like New Dawn. What can be that 10%, that return of our commitment to God? 
I want to say that the detail here is not so important as the commitment itself. What have we committed to God as individuals? Have we committed to trust Jesus for our lives? Have we committed to be part of his kingdom, building his church, building his world? It might be very different for very different ones of us. God met Jacob and accepted him. And the promise is going to be fulfilled through Jacob. God's given him promises for the journey ahead. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. As the chapters ahead unfold, Jacob is not having, going to have a smooth and easy time. He'll end up finding he's married the wrong wife, for starters, and so on. His uncle Laban's going to be really difficult to him. But it does mean God is with him. And that's all he needs. For that he worships. And, and that should be enough for us. God is with us. In a moment, we're going to sing a, a song that is quite a modern song that's become a real favourite for me. I make no excuses that we're going to sing it again this morning, apart from the fact I will really enjoy it. I want to read you uh, the last verse and chorus, and it says, With every breath I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, and glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. And I was reflecting, why has this song so struck a chord with me? And it's that last line, yet not I, but through Christ in me. So don't go away this morning thinking that what I've been talking about is about making vows and doing things in your own strength. Anything that we do, anything that we achieve, anything that Jacob achieved was because of God in him. So let's, the music group come and let's sing it together and let's really reflect on that. Yet not I, but through Christ in me.